For today's episode of the podcast, I am extremely grateful to be joined by Professor Jason McIsaac of the University of Toronto. He's got more than two decades of experience working in the video game industry. He helps me break down the history of microtransactions, loot boxes, and other predatory practices in the game business, and how governments are responding. It was an insightful chat that I think you will gain a lot from. So, without further ado, on with the show. All right, I am very happy today to be joined by Professor Jason McIsaac of the University of Toronto, formerly of Electric Playground, uh, formerly a game designer. I mean, it feels like you've had every single job possible in the game business at some point. How are you doing today, uh, Jason? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. And yes, I have had many jobs in the video game industry. Um, I've even been a booth babe for IDOS doing Laura Croft. <laughs> okay, well, I, had that been true, I would have forced you to produce some uh, photographic evidence. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, yeah, but I'm doing pretty good. It's an interesting time to be teaching, but uh, hey, the video game industry goes on. Yes. Uh, so we should mention that we are recording this I- remotely in isolation. And uh, saying that, uh, being in isolation and spending more time at home has given me an opportunity to play a few more games than I have in the past uh, couple years. And it also sort of reminded me on some of the reasons why I've slightly soured on some of the gaming business. And that's actually what we're here to talk about. Um, so uh, before we get into those topics, uh, maybe you can do a uh, do us a favor and sort of give us the state of the gaming industry around and leading up to 2007, 2008, which I think anyone is going to agree is a seminal moment in uh, the gaming business. Yes, well, there's uh, there's so much that's happened with microtransactions and so much that's still happening. It's difficult to know where to start. And in fact, because everything is constantly changing, I'm a little worried about naming specific games because I could say, oh, the microtransactions in this game are like this. And somebody listens to this a week from now or a year from now, and they say, no, they're not. So that's one of the problems. But basically, microtransactions, um, they go back to kind of the MMO space where it used to be that um, games like Ultima Online, World of Warcraft, they used to be based on a subscription. So you'd pay a flat fee for a month's worth of use or however it worked. You know, there's usually a deal for six months or 12 months. But eventually they went to a free-to-play model where you pretty much, well, depending on the uh, the MMO, a lot of them went to a free-to-play model where you could get the actual initial game client for free but any kind of cosmetic changes, like you want your character to have a red shirt or a particular hat, uh, you buy that separately. It was purely cosmetic. And it also came, um, lar- a big influence too was also uh, the Chinese market. China, for the longest time, didn't have access to consoles. And so their gaming industry was very self contained, very, very self serving. But the problem is, China has for a long, long time had a huge problem with piracy. So most of the software models there are based on the idea that you get the client for free, the basic game, and you play a little bit, and then any kind of customization, like uh, I want to customize my go-kart with this flame decal or the uh, decal, or I want to uh, give my character a particular helmet, you pay extra. And although initially we thought back then this is silly. Who's going to pay for a green shirt for their character? And the answer is quite a lot of people, actually. And uh, so that's where it kind of happened in the console PC space. But as you were pointing out, um, the thing that really made it explode was when Apple launched the iPhone and then later the App Store. The App Store had, uh, it did something that no one had been able to do beforehand, which was it actually made mobile gaming practical. Now, mobile gaming has been around for a very long time, well before the iPhone. But the problem is the stores were so crude and so useless that most people, the vast majority of people, 
did not actually use their phones to purchase any kind of game or application. Uh, the only games they played were things like Snake or Tetris or whatever came actually embedded on the deck itself. But when the App Store opened, all of a sudden, getting new software for your phone was super easy and super cheap. So we had an explosion of games and all kinds of apps on the iPhone. And that that was great for a lot of things, you know, the sheer amount of choice that consumers now had. And it was also great for developers who, you know, I have a, I have a new, very popular venue for getting my game out there. And I can also do a smaller game. I don't need to spend millions and millions to make my small, entertaining game for a mobile to phone. But the problem was, one, uh, the sheer amount of software that was dumped on it in a short space of time really drove the prices down. So you couldn't really sell your game for $19.99 unless you were Electronic Arts selling The Sims or you know some kind of recognizable brand name. So a lot of games, you know, they went down to $0.99, cents and then they went to... Uh, we'll monetize them purely through ad revenue, which is not very reliable. And uh, you're not going to serve a lot of ads if you're one of six billion different games. So then they came up with the idea of free game microtransactions. You play a little bit and then you get to a point where if you want to keep going in this game or you want something special, you got to pay for it. And this model has proven to be extraordinarily successful. As much as some people hate microtransactions, there's one thing that cannot be disputed. It works. It makes a lot of money. Definitely. So you mentioned a lot there, so I want to unpack it a little bit. Um, Let's go back to that 2007-2008 period with the launch of the iPhone. Now at that time, consoles are huge and sort of what people think is a video game you know sitting back on the couch with the controller playing nintendo playstation so what was going on in that space and how did the arrival of the iphone and microtransactions influence the triple a big blockbuster games like call of duty grand theft auto and games like that well the the triple a video game industry had had and still has i think a problem in that they don't know how to implement them fairly, at least not in all cases, but I guess that's a a whole other topic. Uh, In the early days, the attempts at microtransactions, uh, they usually called it, well, first of all, it was just DLC. You want to uh, get a few extra quests for your RPG, download the uh, insert name here, DLC. And that looked okay in a lot of cases. I mean, you can go back even further than that. There are games that had expansion packs when you went into a store and, uh, oh, here's the expansion for this particular game. You need the the core game, and here's the expansion pack. You pay a little more for it, not usually as much as a full game, but you get some extra. And then DLC looked to be an equivalent of that. You know, hey, it's an expansion pack. You're just getting it digitally. Except people started to notice that a lot of them didn't have nearly as much content as uh, a really dedicated expansion pack. And then they started getting into the sort of model that mobile games and uh, uh, PC games were going for, which was things like, uh, well, one of the most notorious and meme-worthy ones was the horse armor in the Elder Scrolls Oblivion which um, there's an RPG, and you think that, uh, hey, a great way to have DLC, uh, maybe new weapons, new armor. Well, the first thing they introduced, I think it was the first thing they introduced, was armor for your horse. And that was $2.50, uh, the equivalent of. At the time, Microsoft and uh, others were using a point system that was roughly the equivalent, but it was basically 250 US dollars, 250, sorry, Two dollars and fifty cents U.S. to buy horse armor, not two hundred and fifty. Two dollars and fifty cents, and a lot of people said this is ridiculous and a rip off, and lots of editorials were wrote, written about it, and lots of people got on, you know, posted videos because you know YouTube was starting about that same point too, I believe, going on what a horrible idea it was, and once again the punchline of this joke, and a lot of people don't realize it, it worked that horse armor actually sold for all the criticism it got. So after things like that, it was clear that you can get away with this. 
and some companies did it better than others. You know, here's an expansion pack for, uh, sorry, DLC for a fighting game, where uh, you get extra characters. Okay, that's fine, especially if the initial game had lots of characters to begin with. DLC for a few more characters, yeah, okay. But then it got gradually crazier and crazier until we've got things like uh, Metal Gear Survive. Uh, you can uh, spend virtual currency to unlock another save slot, or you can buy money to buy the use real money to buy virtual currency and then unlock an extra slave slot save slot, which that used to be standard, multiple slots or character profiles for your game. Uh, there were others, like uh, another one that got a lot of flack was Azura's Wrath, where it was actually advertised that the true ending of the game was coming in DLC format. So that means you played through the game and you thought you got to the ending of the narrative, the story, you've completed the game. No, you didn't get the real narrative. That's going to cost you a few extra bucks. And that's kind of where we are now. People figuring out uh, where is the line drawn? What will people reject? And what will people accept? So, uh, yeah. And uh, we haven't even gotten to loot boxes yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and we will get there. Um, I still want to just, uh, just finish up on that uh, brief period before the end of the last uh, decade, or I guess the end of two decades ago. Uh, it, and uh, at that time, uh, there was also... Uh, a big pl new player in the gaming space, and that was Facebook. And uh, we saw Zynga, uh, a company that it's sort of people have forgotten about, emerge. And and not only did Zynga emerge as a huge company, they took top executive talent from Microsoft. And yep. so uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate on that a little bit and how they distinguish them, how they were different in their uh, economic model versus uh, maybe some of the mobile players. Yeah, well, Zynga, I believe, actually, when, when Facebook opened itself up to gaming, uh, Zynga was, uh, they made a, a Texas Hold'em game that was the first game to actually go up on Facebook. I may be wrong about that. You might want to double check. And that was an instance of... Uh, you gamble virtual currency. Then along came Farmville, and Farmville probably sent everyone the message like, this is how it's done. Farmville is a game in which you have a virtual farm. If anyone's played uh, Stardew Valley, very similar uh, Harvest Moon series. But here's a game where you go around and you plant some stuff. Now, of course, in a regular video game, you plant some whatever, tomatoes, and you know some in-game time goes by, you harvest the tomatoes, you sell them, you take that money, you buy some more stuff, you expand, you know, typical game stuff. But in Farmville, you'd plant something and then you'd have to wait a long time, you know, maybe several hours. Uh, depending on the games that use the Farmville model, you might be waiting a couple of days for something to happen. Um, but you could spend virtual currency to speed it up. And in order to uh, speed up the game and uh, get virtual currency, if you don't happen to have enough virtual currency earned, because you could earn it through various in-game activities, well, here's an opportunity to buy virtual currency for real currency, and then you can speed it up and you can plant your tomatoes. And the great thing about Farmville from the developer's point of view was it's not nearly as high tech as something like uh, an Elder Scrolls Oblivion or a Call of Duty where we have to make sure that we spend top dollar on the best graphics and the best networking software. This is a very, fairly low tech game, comparatively speaking, but it, uh, through microtransactions, very quickly was taking in billions. Uh, I believe um, within six months, they had something like 10 million daily users. And normally what would happen, or I guess what the idea was initially, would be that you have your game running and Facebook is serving ads, so you get a cut of the ad revenue. Well, ad revenue is nice. I mean, certainly no one's going to turn it down, but it couldn't hold a candle to the microtransactions. 
And even though Facebook games, most of them were free to initially play, it turned out that you know you have a whole bunch of people who never would spend a single cent on a microtransaction, you know, buying virtual currency. But those that did often bought a lot of it. There's a term they actually use now called a whale. Um, so we have a lot of fish who never actually spend any money on our game, but we land a couple of whales who can spend, like no joke, thousands over the years or sometimes over the weeks. And that is a great way to make a whole lot of cash. So yeah, face, uh, Facebook and Farmville in particular, they're the ones that sort of showed us, okay, here's how we can do it and make truckloads of money. Okay, uh, I really like that uh, concept because I think it touches on some ideas about design. If if all your revenue is coming from one percent of the audience or less, you're you're gonna design your game in a way that targets those people uh, specifically. And uh, we'll get back to that when we touch on some design things. Um, so, uh, uh, but from that, I want to move on. I think that was a great, uh, recap of, uh, what Zynga and Facebook, uh, did. So, um, I, I also want to touch on that idea that you mentioned that, you know, the graphics didn't have to be top notch and the games are effectively three free. Meanwhile, these people who are making Halo are using the cut most cutting edge graphics. They're spending, you know, the budgets are, uh, a hundred million dollars potentially on a game like that and they're still trying to charge sixty dollars to consumers so uh maybe you can talk about uh the pressures the economic pressures that that was driving towards even the biggest games in the industry well interestingly enough i found out about the whole microtransaction things through uh, uh david perry who's a game designer you know, shiny entertainment. Uh, I talked to him in 2007, I think it was. And he had just come back from China where he had been involved in several companies making games. And he revealed to me that in China, these companies would spend their money making games. Now, even though there were not, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto level productions, it's still a fair amount of money. But because it was spent, uh, the economics and the profit of it was all driven by microtransactions, it was scary because you could launch your game. And if you didn't get an audience right then and there, you saw that your game was a flop. You could literally make zero dollars on the first day. Whereas with video games and the traditional model, we have pre orders, we have other things. Uh, we're much more organized about that now. But uh, I think that was one of the issues that kind of carried over to North America. Under the old model, you spent your money, you know, your $60, $70, $80, whatever it was, you got your game. And on top of that, now they put on microtransactions, which I think is where a lot of people have the problem. So you can understand why it sort of ha it happens from a publisher's perspective. We will get the initial sale of the game, you know, our typical 60, 70 bucks. And we take that same game and we're normally, once that initial purchase is spent, uh, that's it. We can't rely on that person for any more unless we happen to offer some DLC. But if we offer things like loot boxes or continually customizable content that's sold for microtransactions, we can get that $60 and we can get people buying microtransaction after microtransaction and uh, further filling our bank account. So that's kind of where, that's how it evolved here in North America. China was a little bit different. And what we see in North America is kind of a hybrid of the two systems, which I think is where the problems, a lot of the problems with microtransactions lie. Okay, so we've gone through microtransactions and you've mentioned a couple of times this, uh, this idea of loot boxes. So maybe we can talk about what is a loot box and when they emerged and uh, how popular they are right now. Let's see, there's uh, some dispute over whether where loot boxes came from. Uh, the earliest one, I think, is uh, from Maple Story. They had a uh, prize system, I think it was called, uh, 
uh, gachapons. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. I apologize. But it was this thing where you uh, you got these boxes and you had to bring them to certain places so they would open up and then they would give you a random item. See, prior to this, the idea was you microtransaction, here is a weapon. I want this weapon. It costs 99 cents or whatever. I spend my 99 cents, I now have my weapon. Okay, great. But with a loot box, they've actually added an extra step which further monetizes the game, which is you do a bunch of activities and you earn sometimes virtual currency, which you then spend on loot boxes, which have a chance of giving you a really good item. Usually the loot box or uh, loot crate, they've got different names for them. You, uh, you open them up and they'll give you a series of items, some good items, some bad items, and hopefully once in a while you'll get a really nice item. But if you don't, you can grind away at the game, earn more loot boxes, or once again, you can use real money to buy virtual money to buy loot boxes. And then uh, hopefully you keep that up for a while. Eventually you will get the nice weapon that you wanted. But uh, it's literally up to chance at this point. It's not like uh, see the thing, buy the thing. That is gone in a lot of the games that use loot boxes. Okay. And uh, I, I venture to say this is a successful model. It has been, uh, <laughs> depending on your point of view. Financially I, lucrative. Yeah, it's been depressingly successful. Uh, in 2017, Activision Blizzard, uh, they reported that half of their income or their, their profit was due to DLC. Uh, over half of their income was due to DLC and microtransactions. So, and that we're talking about, uh, I think their revenue in 2017 was, I probably jotted it down somewhere. Maybe I did, but uh, <laughs> I think it was $4 billion. So half of that, of their income, $4 billion was microtransactions or DLC. So when you get that kind of money, you are not going to give it up without a fight. Mm -hmm. And this, and this, uh, these loot boxes also are pervasive in free to play and mobile games as well. Like it's not just these uh, AAA high budget games that have adopted this uh, strategy. Yes, a lot of games have adopted the loot box model. Because it, uh, in addition to, well, the reason why it's so successful is because it's so compelling. It's just like uh, dropping a coin in a slot machine. I open my loot box and, uh, okay, you know, it's spinning through a bunch of items. Hopefully something cool comes up and uh, try again. Uh, I've played games where there are loot boxes, but they're not actually purchased in game. For example, um, I played the Friday the 13th multiplayer game for a time. And uh, you can take your experience points and roll perks, which you can outfit on your counselor to give you an advantage to survive. And uh, these perks are random, um, the type of perk, plus its value. So here's a perk that, uh, you know, it makes you 5% uh, more visible. Sometimes, oh, I rolled the same perk, but this one's 7% more uh, vis uh, less visible. So you not only get uh, the same items, you get different um, different values for them. And creating that kind of thing where it's simply a number, that's very easy to monetize. It's, uh, you know, you can just uh, adjust a few numbers and then all of a sudden you not only have one thing to sell, you have three things to sell, but you don't actually have to create any kind of new art asset or new audio asset. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah. People are yeah. finding all sorts of ways. Uh huh. Well, I think you kind of touched on uh, really the most important thing, uh, which uh, I've been dancing around, and that was with your slot machine analogy. So we went from we're selling people extra content, either be it actual extra um, things to do, accomplish in these games, be it quests, levels, 
Then we moved on to extra content in the form of uh, cosmetic things that they could apply to their uh, characters or environments. And now we're transitioning into a chance to get an item. You said compelling and you used slot machine as an example. And I remember you taught me that in the video game industry, it's a sin to say something's addictive. You say it's compelling. Right. So maybe you want to touch that one. A lot of game developers don't like the word addictive because of the negative connotations. Uh, heroin is addictive. You know, we mean addict addictive in the sense that this game is so great, we just don't want to put it down. It's so much fun. But uh, I won't dance around the issue anymore. I will say it clearly. I believe that loot boxes are gambling. They touch all the same things in our brain that you know a slot machine does or a hand of poker. It's based almost entirely on uh, chance versus skill. And uh, even though you're gambling with virtual currency, you know, often purchased by actual currency, some can argue that, well, the only difference is that uh, this thing may never pay out. Well, actually, I guess that's true of uh, gambling as well. But um, it's gambling. I, I don't see how it can be argued otherwise. I know that a lot of people don't like that because the connotations there, you know, I, I'm not a person who hangs around casinos or buys $200 worth of lottery tickets. But I'm telling you, psychologically speaking, loot boxes hit all of the same triggers that gambling does. So I, I don't really see the distinction. And so I actually want to explore that more. So maybe to do so, uh, I think it's actually important to talk about the concept of the game loop and how games are designed. Uh, can, can you do that? Well, the idea of a game, a good game at least, is they will say that you get into what's known as a core game loop. You know, what do you do in this game? So I go out and I fight monsters. I kill the monsters. I gather treasure. I gain experience. I sell the stuff for better weapons. I gain experience to get better abilities. So I go out and fight more monsters, better, tougher monsters, and then I, you know, kill tougher monsters, I get better loot, and on and on it goes. So that's games are built around a repetitive activity, and I don't mean repetitive in the negative sense. I mean repetitive in that there's this sort of zen-like state. They actually call it the flow in a lot of game design circles, where you're you're playing the game, you're accomplishing things, and you're gradually progressing, getting better, getting bigger, more powerful throughout the game. And it's usually a, a procedure that can be almost broken down to four or five steps, uh, the core game loop. So what a lot of, because this thing is so repetitive and soothing, uh, it also can become addictive in the psychological sense. Because there are people that uh, long before loot boxes were basically staying in cyber cafes for two or three days straight and dying of dehydration because they could not tear themselves away from the game. Now, I'm not saying that you know, World of Warcraft or any other thing like that is as bad as cigarettes, but there is, you know, psychological addiction is a real thing and uh, it's something that has to be watched out for. So video games already have that uh, you know look up operant conditioning thing going for them. Now you add loot boxes and gambling mechanics, and people who are vulnerable to this sort of thing, um, they got to watch out. Yes, and even the sort of design phase of iterating on an idea. So let's say you have you have a dis let's say we're just talking about gameplay. We're not even talk. We're going back to that game loop idea. You test a level. You you know maybe to the outside observer, a level seems to be designed by an artist or a team of artists, and it's some form of artistic expression, and that's true somewhat. But a lot of that is just refined through testing to produce that sort of optimal game loop experience and that iterative process is also applied to those 
microtransactions, and those loot boxes. So even the animations and sound effects when you open the loot boxes participate in giving you that dopamine burst that your brain is craving. Yes, one of the things that uh, microtransactions and loot boxes are heavily criticized over, or the games that implement them, is what they do is they simply chop out a lot of the features that you normally would have got just by buying the game outright. You mentioned you know, something simple as like an, an animation. Uh, there are games, uh, sports games, for example, where you can unlock a, a dunk style, for example, or a, a celebration. You know, just animation, which would normally just be part of the game. And so now that's attached to a microtransaction. There's a great episode of South Park called uh, Freemium Isn't Free that breaks this down very, very well. What they say is, um, from our point of view as the consumers, stuff we used to get for free is now being gutted. The game's now being gutted so it can be sold back to us. But South Park actually said something very wise in that the the worst of these games, because I'll say many are better than others, they're not all like this. I'm not actually opposed to microtransactions completely. But the worst defenders of this sort of thing, they will make a game just fun enough so that you're kind of already hooked and you're a little impatient to get to that next level. Like, okay, the game is almost there what do i got to do to make it to the next part well instead of playing you can pay and that is where microtransactions cross the line for a lot of people including myself okay um but as we've mentioned they're extremely uh successful and uh on that note we were talking about the triple a game model where there's they're paying, you know, they want you to pay $60, but now they're going to put microtransactions on top of that and loot boxes on top of that. So you're paying more and more. But now what we've seen in the last couple years is they've abandoned that $60 upfront cost. We have some of the biggest games in the industry with the most cutting edge technology are now free. So maybe you want to talk about those big players. Yeah, I think that if done right, this can be, this is the way to do microtransactions. If you do it right, you take a game that has really good core gameplay and you offer it for free. And as you pointed out, the number of games have actually gone this route and then they will monetize based entirely on microtransactions. That's how the company will get its profit. Now, as long as they're not doing the predatory stuff with loot boxes, uh, and as long as they're not gutting parts of the game, you know, they're actually offering a, a pretty interesting clip of game, good gameplay just to get you hooked. I'm okay with that. Uh, and some games have done it better actually than other AAA games like, uh, one of the uh, extra kicks in the pants to the game Anthem by Bioware is that Apex Legends is doing so much better and it got nowhere near the amount of hype, but it's got a free to play model and then, you know, the microtransactions. Whereas with Anthem, it was pay up front and then microtransactions on top. Although those microtransactions weren't sketched out very well in the beginning, it seems. So there's, it might not be a perfect comparison. But other games like Fortnite have done extraordinarily well just by offering up the core game experience for free. And so you got a lot of players playing your games. And even again, once you know, once again, if someone is not, or a lot of people are not buying stuff for them, that's okay because. You know, for every, th this isn't an actual statistic, but let's say that for every 20 players that aren't buying something, there's one who is, and they're buying a lot. And that makes up for those that aren't. And uh, Fortnite, probably the most successful example of that. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, I know Fortnite does this. I don't know if they're the first, but they also have seasonal items. Yeah, I don't know who came up with the seasonal pass. Uh, there's different versions of it too but it's almost like a tv show now where 
Fortnite will go through seasons, and in this season we're going to do this, this, and this. And uh, you want to keep playing because these items are only available for the season. So uh, you know, stick around, keep playing the game. And um, I haven't actually gotten to this point in Fortnite myself, so uh, I'm kind of speculating here. But I would think that the best thing to do in this case was, well, the f season's almost over, and you didn't quite earn those items, but you could buy them. Mm -hmm. You know, th that would be one way to get around that. I don't know if they've done that, but uh, it must have crossed their mind if they haven't actually done it already. So we've got Fortnite. You mentioned Apex. Le uh, uh, yeah, Apex Legends. Uh, you know, Fortnite produced by Epic Games. Uh, Apex by Electronic Arts. Just earlier, uh, like a month ago, we had the release of Call of Duty, a free version of Call of Duty. These are these are sixty seventy dollar experiences. Is this the end of you know the boxed AAA game? I think that we're clearly going to digital delivery. Um, you've got to come up with a good model for it. Recently, Microsoft and Sony have done things like Games Pass, which are almost like a Netflix for games. You know, you subscribe for a month, and here's a library of 100 games or so where you can download uh, a game, try it out. You don't like it? Okay, try the next one. And you might get hooked. But the point is, digital delivery is a lot better than it used to be. And video game stores, uh, I, they're clearly suffering from faster internet connections and uh, larger hard drive spaces. Because you go into a video game store now, not that you can while we're all quarantined, but uh, you go into a video game store now, they're toy stores. You know, they sell um, Fortnite Nerf guns or Overwatch Nerf guns or... Uh, you know, mugs shaped like uh, Mario and all sorts of action figures. And uh, the games there, you know, they're getting to be a smaller and smaller presence. So I think that digital delivery, um, there's still lots of people who like the idea of physical media because another problem with the microtransaction model or the seasonal model is that if your game is entirely based on multiplayer, online, games as a service, or live service, however you want to put it, if that service goes away, so does your game. You could, if you wanted to, uh, if you've got an old PlayStation 2, you know, gathering dust in a closet somewhere, and you think, hey, I want to play that game that uh, you know, I played a long time ago. And so you can still you know, get it out of the closet, hook it up, and play that game. But there are some games where once they stop supporting them, that's it. I was hooked for the longest time, I gotta admit. I was hooked for the longest time on a Facebook game called Marvel Avengers Alliance. And eventually Disney decided to can the game. And now I can't play it. It's gone. So all the characters I'd leveled up to max, all the best teams and costumes I've had, I don't have that anymore. So that's another thing that people are worried about with the death of digital media. And I think if you can assure people or allow people to continue to keep their game collection, which some of them are loath to do because, again, they want you to keep buying. But if you can get it to the point where you're not actually losing your library, more and more people will adapt to digital delivery. Okay. Um, so uh, you mentioned when we were talking about the loot boxes that, you know, you viewed them as gambling. And um, I largely agree. And it seems like we're not the only people who think this. Uh, some pretty relevant uh, <laughs> institutions. Uh, maybe you can talk about uh, what the European Union has uh, said about loot boxes. Uh, maybe what China has done or any other uh, notable uh, jurisdiction. Well, all over the world, uh, in the United States, there have been a number of uh, U.S. senators who have started to talk about or even introduce bills that would get microtransactions declared gambling. Now, if that happens, every country in the world has laws about gambling. They've, gambling has been around a long time. It's been recognized usually as a social ill. So there's all sorts of laws already in place, just ready to swoop in. So. If your game that is giving you two billion worth of microtransactions uh, a year gets 
declared gambling, then all of a sudden you inherit a whole bunch of laws which will restrict you from selling it to minors. Uh, governments will step in. There'll be taxations. There'll probably be inspections. It's a whole, whole thing that video game publishers want to avoid. They do not want these things declared uh, gambling. But uh, it's in the water. Uh, people are, uh, are thinking about it. Uh, Belgium, I believe, has actually banned loot boxes for games that are targeted at people under the age of 18. Uh, the Ministry of Culture in China decreed that if you have loot boxes, you have to put the odds on. So here are the odds of winning a platinum item. Here are the odds of winning a gold item, or however it's broken down. So more and more governments are looking at this thinking, wait a minute, this sounds an awful lot like gambling. And some of them still think games are for kids. So there's a bit of that going on. But even the ones that are a little more aware that gamer culture is so much more than children are still thinking this is gambling and we regulate gambling. So we need to step in here. So that's happening. Um, well, they're making noise about it. And uh, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. So there are jurisdictions, uh, governments that have stepped in. I, I know that China isn't the only jurisdiction that is requiring odds to be posted on micro on uh, loot boxes. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned a little bit the response in North America, but maybe you can talk about uh, the ESA, who the ESA is, and if they have any comments on this. The Entertainment Software Association has, uh, it represents video game publishers. Video game publishers, um, they do not want loot boxes to go away. They do not want restrictions placed on them so that they can monetize them however they want. And since the ESA represents those publishers, they don't want them to go away either. And they've been resisting efforts to make that happen. And I think that is a losing battle. Uh, I think they're going to have to make some concessions somewhere because there are some, like, you know, Belgium has already done its thing. Uh, China, it's only going to get worse. And the thing about different jurisdictions saying, okay, here is the rules about microtransactions or about gambling or whatever, that means that if we want to deliver the game in that jurisdiction, we're going to have to take something out of it. So, you know, Belgium doesn't want uh, loot boxes. Okay, no problem. Take out loot boxes. Well, that completely disrupts the game. It means that extra work has to be done to make a particular copy, which is more expense. And you've got communities of gamers saying, hey, how come this jurisdiction has this and we have this, which is different? That's not fair. So... It's going to be far reaching. It only takes one major market to step in. And uh, if that happens, then you're going to see um, publishers change their attitude about microtransactions real quick. Okay. Um, now, uh, one thing um, maybe it's worthwhile to relate to is uh, the ESA and then the experience with the ESRB and how that came to be, because uh, is that a potential uh, for some type of uh, action? The Entertainment Software Association created the ESRB back in the mid to late 90s in order to deal with uh, concern over violent content in video games and violent content being played by children. And I think they handled it very well. I think they did a great job. Um, now, these with these loot boxes, uh, I think they're going to have to make some concessions. For one thing, uh, another problem with the live service model, if a game is online and it's constantly being updated for new content or patches or whatever, that means the game can be significantly different a year down the road. I mean, look at uh, No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky is not the game that came on the disc. But... At one point, somebody rated it, you know, the ESRB rated it and said, okay, it's got these issues, you know, violence or whatever. So imagine a game that starts out and has no microtransactions. The ESRB rates it, and then a couple months later, they add microtransactions. 
now all of a sudden that ESRB rating is out of date. So they're kind of defeating their own their own system of protection there. They're shooting themselves in the foot. It also means, and uh, Jim Sterling pointed this out, Jim Sterling from the Inquisition, who hates microtransactions with a passion. He pointed out that video game reviews are becoming worthless because they're patched all to hell, and then they do something completely different with the microtransactions. They change them all completely. So something you might have mentioned or complained about or praised is now not there. So even our uh, game critics are suffering from microtransactions. You know, pity us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in these times. Um, okay, um, so I think that that uh, really covers most of what I wanted to uh, talk about today. Um, but before I let you go, uh, instead of all this doom and gloom, maybe you can talk about you know some companies or some titles that you think are doing things well because if parents are listening and and they're worried about you know their kids playing certain games or even themselves becoming addicted to certain games what do you is there something you can recommend or you know anything like that well again i'm kind of worried about recommending specific titles because who knows they might be changing them as we speak but um, Forbes magazine had a great article. It's a couple years old now, but it's still pretty on target, uh, called The Ten Commandments of Microtransactions. And they covered things like um, you've got to make the interface very clear because a lot of these microtransaction interfaces, these online stores, they're a complete mess. And one has to wonder if that's by design so that you might accidentally buy something. So... That's one of them. Um, there are, they also mentioned it has to be clear when you're spending money. Um, there's a number of really good guidelines there. I've long said that I think certain games should now go to the freemium model entirely, like say The Sims. What if The Sims was completely free to download, gave you a small portion of content, enough to create your sim and you know build a simple house, and then everything else is microtransactions because we know that there are going to be 20 expansion packs for every single edition of The Sims. Games like uh, Forza Motorsports, they've noticed that it used to come, the game used to come with all sorts of cars and all sorts of tracks, but suddenly and mysteriously, the more recent ones, they actually have less cars and less tracks and less auto manufacturers so that they can offer them through DLC. Well, what if you downloaded the Forza client for free and then you bought the cars that you wanted and you bought the courses that you wanted to race on because not everybody is interested in absolutely every aspect of it. So I, I recognize that model is um, very pie in the sky and uh, I haven't worked out the genius master plan that would make it work, but I really think some games have got, got to start looking that way because... Um, something's got to give, you know, people are not made of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of one last thing that I, I uh, forgot to sort of talk about, and, and uh, maybe it's too broad of a topic, but when I was trying to get into the games business, I, you know, I had like these grandiose ideas. That it was just like another extension of, of cinema. It was, it was just like interactive cinema. And people like Steven Spielberg and Guillermo del Toro were getting involved. And now you don't really hear about Hollywood people being involved in the games industry. The biggest names in the game industry have left. The people at charge of Bioware. Uh, mm -hmm. Dan Hauser has just announced he's leaving. Um, you've got... Um, uh, I mean, and there's, there's so many examples. So... Um, what do you see as the future of this business? Well, I am not totally doom and gloom about this. In fact, one thing that I do remain optimistic about is that there are a lot of great indie games out there, and some of them are getting better and better. Uh, it, there are people worried that because these games, these live service games with microtransactions are so damn profitable, that we're actually going to see the end of single player experiences because it's harder to justify microtransactions in a single-player experience. 
And, uh, you know, looking at things like Fallout 76, when Fallout used to be a single player series of RPGs and Elder Scrolls Online, you know, is Elder Scrolls 6 going to be like Fallout 76? You know, we hope not. But one thing that I do find appealing is that, you know, you've got Kickstarter, um, and yes, there are problems there, but there have been a lot of great games made by people who just want to make a good single player experience or a good self contained game. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's lots of great things out there. You do have to dig a bit deeper. Uh, you won't find them on the shelves of your local big box retailer. But there are more venues to get games out there than ever before. Uh, simple game engines like Unity and uh, Game Maker and RPG Maker. You can do quite a lot with them. And uh, the entry level is not as steep as you might think. So um, the indie scene will save us. That is my hope. Well, I like to end on a hopeful note. So I couldn't think of a better place to uh, call it a night. Uh, Jason, I want to thank you very much for joining me today. Is there anything you want to add to the people listening at home? <laughs> uh, put me on the spot here. Um, <laughs> let's see. Don't give up hope. Um, and if you're not, if you're looking for the game that you want to play and you can't find it, maybe think about making it because you're probably not the only one who feels that way. And you'd be surprised at just what's out there to help you make stuff. You may not become you know, the next uh, Hideo Kojima, you might not make uh, Grand Theft Auto levels of money, but you can make your mark and uh, there's a lot of good stuff being done out there. So again, just look around. Thank you very much to Professor Jason McIsaac for talking to us today, and thank you to everyone for listening at home. We'll be back soon with another episode.